there's always the three things, the, the, the macro the three things that you need to transition from an agent that's doing what everybody, and guys, this is almost every broker and almost every brokerage, they're all out there telling you to close deals. I will never train you to close deals mm -hmm. because if you close deals, you're gonna be chasing paychecks for the rest of your life. And guess what? You know who does that? Employees. Mm -hmm. I got in this business to not behave like an employee. I'm the CEO of the operation. I wanna build a stinking business. I wanna build a business that's self-sustaining, which means I can't close deals. I have to close customers. I need to have people that not only come to me. I don't have a lead funnel. I have a lead hourglass. These are the folks that I close down here at the bottom. They send me people. They bring me more business. They want to see me win because there's nothing in this universe more than I want to see my people win. They sign with me. They're going to come out ahead and they're going to know they came out ahead because I gave them everything I got. Welcome to the Success with Listings podcast, where we help you get success in the real estate game the easy way. Now you can get off the roller coaster of feast and famine and out of the rat race of competing with every other agent in town. Hi, I'm Nolly Williams. I took over a thousand listings during my first 10 years in the real estate game. And in this podcast, I show you how to have success with listings. Let's go. Okay, here we go. All right. You know, I have one of my favorite people in the house, Mr. Josh Cadillac. Now, before I get him in on the show, I want to tell you a little bit about this man. He's been in real estate for over a decade, in fact, over 15 years. He is an incredible person. He's got more designations than anyone that I've ever met in this game, okay? He is the host of an incredible podcast, the Know Your Shit podcast. Am I saying that right, Josh? All right. Yes, you are. <laughs> and uh, he is just an incredible person. What I love about Josh is the fact that he is on a mission, just like I am, to reduce the failure rate in this industry. And if I had to sum up what he's all about, he is all about helping you to become a consummate professional in this game. There's so many uh, that, that Josh has pointed out. I love his, his, his latest book where he points out there's so many of us that have a long way to go to be the professional that we absolutely can be so that we can remove all fear, so that we can be uh, well, I should say it fearless so that we can have the confidence to go into any listing presentation and nab it right off the bat. So Mr. Josh Cadillac, he is the author of the national bestseller out on McGraw Hill, Close for Life. What's up, Josh? How we doing, buddy? Ah, uh, man, not only anytime I can hang out with you, buddy, it's going to be a good day, man. It's, it's great. It's, it's a great day to be alive. Well, I, I got to mention too, man, you are a family man and- <laughs> <laughs> you, this you're, true. you're, this is right now as we're actually doing this is sort of the end of the day. Uh, I'm sure you're ready to go home and hang out with family and eat, but you, you said, Hey, let me hang out with Nolly and let's bring some knowledge to the tribe. So I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. You know what, Nolly, I, I I've learned a long time ago and I was just reading it the other day. It's a tremendous gift to be able to say something at the right time that somebody needs to hear. And so I don't know if I ever get the opportunity to do that, but if there ever is the, the, the ability to speak into somebody's life and make it a little bit better, man, I, I can't imagine something that's much better than that or much more meaningful. So hopefully something that I picked up, some of the shrapnel wounds across my body that I picked up in, in the years of doing this, the brain damage uh, can take and help maybe somebody avoid some of the pitfalls, pain and suffering I had to go through to learn this stuff and a lot of it the hard way. Cause even with the designations and certifications, man, there's just so much stuff. They don't tell you, they don't teach you. That's the real world, you know? Well, and you know, hard the, part. The, the designations that you got were not for your resume. They were, you know, because you're a lifelong learner, you love oh, to yeah. learn as much as you love to teach. Sure. So you just, you just absorb, you love to, to gain knowledge. Uh, yeah. And then you like to pass that knowledge on. So that's very unusual. Let me, <laughs> let, thing. Yeah, let, let me talk about that for a minute because most people, uh, Josh, are, and I just got to say it, they're they're not givers in the, I mean, they are givers maybe at heart, but they don't mm -hmm. exercise it as much as they could perhaps. What really, because you were, you, you, you've always been super successful as an agent. Uh, what got you into the idea that you wanted to give back and teach? Um. It's kind of a, you know, there's that song, I think it's Rascal Flats, God Bless the Broken Road. Um, it was kind of a broken road that got me there, Nolly. I, um, there was a, two things I said that I would never do when I got out of high school. I would never speak publicly because 
no way. That that's terrifying. And the other thing is, I'd never write another paper again. I would never write like there is never writing papers used to annoy the ever loving heck out of me. So those two things I said no. Right. So when I got into real estate, I did it basically because of a whole lot of bad things that happened in other businesses that I had, the housing crisis, at whatever. I found myself, as many people do, foisted into real estate because it was the best choice that it appeared that was around for me. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I knew I didn't know what the hell I was doing, right? And so it wasn't reasonable for me, in my view of the world, to go out and ask people for their trust to represent this massive transaction without pursuing as much as I could, bolstering my knowledge base to make sure that I was doing the right thing by them, right? This whole fake it till you make it thing that this industry is about drove me up a wall. Hey, look, you're licensed. Go get all your friends and family to give you all their business because, well, when you screw it up, they can't get rid of you, your family. Like, I, I hate that, man, right? Yeah. So yeah. I went after everything I could get. And, and in the process, I mean, I've always known that like if I knew something and you needed to know it, I, I'm always happy to explain it to you. I, I, I'd love to help you if I could. And I learned that a lot of the classes because I'd be sitting next to somebody that was struggling, especially CCIM. The guy sitting next to me was just getting his butt kicked. He's like, I, I don't get it. And like when it's it's almost all math. So like if you start to fall behind, you're like screwed. Yeah. And so I'm sitting here and as fast as I'm learning, I'm turning around and trying to explain it to me. And it felt really good when he passed. I almost felt like I felt better about him passing than me passing this stupid thing. And so I knew that I liked it. But I didn't know that I had the chops to do it on a basis, a larger basis. And so I would go for my office. They would ask me, I, because I'm taking all these classes, I knew how to like the MLS worked and all the forms and stuff. I knew it better than everybody because I was taking the like up-to-date stuff. And so they, uh, the broker said, hey, look, would you mind explaining it to our people? Now, this would be a room of eight, 10 people, all of whom I knew. Nolly, I couldn't do it standing up because my knees would shake so bad. I would be so scared. And so that was kind of the genesis point of, of, of the teaching that, and I would go, it was really the first two years that I got a lot of my designations done because of this insecurity that I didn't know what I was doing. Right. I mean, I was still actually a top producer in those first two years, but still with the, like I'm doing a ton of deals mm -hmm. or getting a lot of listings. I mean, cause don't forget it was 2008, 2009, not a lot was selling, but I was carrying at the end of my first year, I was killing like 40 active listings. At the end of the year two, I averaged between 70 and 80 active listings from 2009 all the way through till 2019. Incredible. So, I mean, I was do doing a lot of business, but I was going to, um, I would go to classes. And at some point I was saying to the folks that ran education at Miami, look, guys, I know you're teaching this stuff but I'm doing the business and there's a dissonance between what I actually need to know to do this business well and what they're telling me in the collect. Like they're not lining up. It's like somebody who read a book about real estate is real estate is trying to tell me how to do real estate, like a college professor telling me how to do something that they've never done, but they have a PhD. So they know, right? right. There's a disconnect between what I'm actually seeing. And so at some point they said to me, Josh, you know what? You should write a class. You come to enough. We like the way you, if you talk. If if you would write a class, we would let you put it on. Mm. So I said, all right, you know what? Let me work on that. So I spent like a year and a half, two years working with this lady who's like a master of getting these class approved. And I wrote my, getting these class approved for C. I wrote what was my magnum opus. Mm. Two days, two day class. Because back in that time, it was easier to get agents to sit for like a day, a full day or two. Sure two-day class. Here is everything from meeting the customers to contracts, to negotiation, to the investment side, to distresses. Like it wasn't comprehensive. It was a smattering of what you needed to know mm -hmm. to be better at this game. And it's better than what anybody else is telling you anyplace else. Right. Yeah. So I put it together and the folks at Miami ghosted me. They didn't let me, they, they wouldn't even, nobody would answer my call anymore. They didn't want to take and let me put it on. Mm. And so um, it sat there for about a year. And then I had somebody in Pensacola. Mm. So I'm on Southeast Florida. I'm down by a man. Pensacola is as physically far away from where I am while still being in, like if you sneeze, you're in Alabama, right? right. That's how far <laughs> Pensacola is. Yeah. And they gave me a shot. And so I went in there and I taught that class. 
And by the end, and I'm, I'm again, if I was insecure going into real estate, now I'm going into something else. And I really don't know what that, like, do I have enough material? What happens if I'm, you know, five in, hours in and I've gone through both days of stuff, you know, like all this, I didn't know what I was getting into. So I finished day two and I had a guy who was a CCIM. So CCIMs are the, oh, yeah. the heavy hitters, right? Yeah, These yeah. are the guys that have taken the hardest stuff that we have in real estate as far as education. He came up to me at the end of the class. He said, I've taken lots of trainings. I have never taken anything that good. Mm. And I was I like, you know what? Yeah. It, maybe I got something here because, yeah. you know, I'm always the one to like be worried that what I'm giving people isn't as good as it needs to be. Like, I, I, I know that I can't necessarily trust my take on it. So it, it's going to come from the consumers to, to, to verify it. Yeah. And so I think that was, I, I had that one, one training that year, the following year, it was like three because word started to get around a little bit. Oh, you got to try this. Right. And uh, the following year it was like 12 and this year it'll be about 250. My goodness. Days that I speak. My that, 250 what, days that you're actually speaking. Yeah. It's yeah. every single day since the second week of January so far with the exception of July 10th. Wow. For some reason, July 10th, nobody wanted, but <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. So that that's just incredible, man. What so so why do you care so much, Josh? You know, I read I read Close for Life. And when I read the book, what it what what I saw in it, like I said, man, this is the book I wish I'd have had when I first got in the business, because this is the book that actually uh really closes the gaps. You know, you see a lot of gaps in the education and training that we have as realtors and brokers. And this this book helped to kind of close a lot of those gaps for, uh, you know, for, for, especially for any really for any agent um, that might be struggling or may not have the confidence. I feel sure. like someone can learn your material and gain the confidence that they need to go in and hit it out of the park. So so why do you care so much, man? What What's what's behind that? Because I know you care. I've. I've I've uh, I've hung around you enough to to know that this is this really gets under your skin. You want us to be better at an industry. Totally. I mean, it's because Nolly, and I really learned this more as I I started to speak. I'd look in the eyes of these people that are in the room taking time away from money making activities, desperately having some hoping somebody's going to tell them what the missing piece is to make it better. So they're trying, these are not the agents that are the problem. The problem ones are the ones that don't show up to class. Right. That's an old, a whole special kind of brain damage that they either think or don't care that they don't know enough, right? So these folks that are the good folks that are in here trying to get this right, they sit there and they have people waste their freaking time all the time talking about all this stuff that frankly doesn't move the needle if I got told one more time, Nolia, that I needed a business plan, I was told 5,000 freaking times I needed a business plan. Nobody told me I should know what the hell I'm talking about. How about start? And Oh, my God. Here's one. You, you want me to hit on one that just eats my soul? Mm. Nolly, you need to make your, you need to take and make your proposition. You need to take and make your value proposition. fan freaking tastic. I love the term. Nobody tells you what it freaking means. Right. That's right. When I was, a, I used to kid with people. I say, when I was a young guy, I wasn't good at dating girls. I was, I was homeschool kid. What are you going to do? Like I, I had negative game, Nolly. <laughs> so I would ask my female friends, why are girls so rude to me? I just go and say, Hey, you know, like my name is Josh or whatever. Like I just, I don't know. They say to me, I said, what am I doing? I want to say, be more confident. Right. Now, while totally true, it is the most useless information in the Absolutely. universe because I have no idea what that means. Right. And right. so when they tell you to make your value proposition, unless they specifically say, hey, here's how, what you need to know. Here's the stuff the customer, I can assume they want to know. If they're not teaching you to take and make assumptions, if they're not teaching you to anticipate your customer, they're not telling you how to do it. They're just saying this thing that's true, but right. totally useless if you don't know how to do it. And so um, I would hear all this stuff and I'd realize they're getting these people to spend, let's just, let's say it was a free class. They're very rarely free classes. They're fr It's a free class. 
they're asking them to exchange one of the two scarce resources in life, time. Right. They're asking them to reduce money-making activity, to mm -hmm. sit here and get something mm -hmm. that's offering a promising an ROI, and they're failing to yield that. I'm that's sorry right. to me. That's, right. that's, that's just right. wrong, especially yeah. to good people trying yeah. to do the right thing. And so for me, I was bothered by that enough, and it, it still eats at my soul. So, I mean... My goal when I teach a class, man, is to make sure I don't give them a second, not one second of regret that they're there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I so mean, you know, I, I had a teacher um, tell me once, she says, Nolly, teaching is the profession that chooses you. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't choose to become a teacher. You just are one. And at some point in life, it just shows up in who you are. And then you start taking the, the reins of that. Um, because, you know, you and I, Josh, we could just sit you know, in our own little corner and sell a crap ton of real estate Man. and and just get as rich as fat and sassy as we want to be. And we don't have to turn back around and lend that hand to the next person trying to climb up the mountain. But there's something within us that says, you know, we, I want, I want to help these people. I want to help. And so uh, it, it's quite, it's quite incredible. It's, it's, it's an incredible uh, thing that, that you're doing and not just that you're doing it, but you're doing it right. You know, you're not doing it from ego. You're right, doing it man. from you're, you're you're doing it from care. You're doing it from knowledge, from real knowledge, and it's and it's information that is so useful. So, speaking of that, let's get into it. Let's talk about today. What are some of the things that? Uh, and obviously, we didn't prepare for this. It's off the cuff. We're just having a conversation like we often do. Um, what are some of the things that real estate agents should be looking for to up their game, or specifically? Or what are, what are some of the biggest red flags that you see? And you go to, you know, as you're going to the classes and you're running across hundreds and hundreds of agents um, that are just trying to trying to do better, but they just can't quite, they're just, there's something missing. Um, what um, are some of those pieces? Sure. I, I, I think I've tried to break it down to three. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's always the three things, the, the, the macro th three things that you need to transition from an agent that's doing what everybody, and guys, this is almost every broker and almost every brokerage, they're all out there telling you to close deals. I will never train you to close deals mm -hmm. because if you close deals, you're gonna be chasing paychecks for the rest of your life. And guess what? You know who does that? Employees. Mm -hmm. I got in this business to not behave like an employee. I'm the CEO of the operation. I wanna build a stinking business. I wanna build a business that's self-sustaining, which means I can't close deals. I have to close customers. I need to have people that not only come to me. I don't have a lead funnel. I have a lead hourglass. These are the folks that I close down here at the bottom. They send me people. They bring me more business. They want to see me win because there's nothing in this universe more than I want to see my people win. They sign with me. They're going to come out ahead and they're going to know they came out ahead because I gave them everything I got. Everything, right? So to me, it's got to start with closing customers for life, which means we have to fundamentally look at how we interact with them. We are trained in this industry. Go in and ask them questions. Ask them open-ended questions. Make them feel heard. If I want to teach you to take and sell, use cars, Nolly, you know what I'm going to tell you? Go ask them questions. Ask them open-ended questions. Make them feel heard. Guys, they already think that as agents walking in the door, understand, if you're going to learn to negotiate, you have to understand, first and foremost, your starting position. You walk in the door as a real estate agent, they think you're lazy, not very smart, overpaid, and all you care about is commission. That's your starting point. You have to negotiate your way out of that before you start asking questions because otherwise they're going to lie to you because they think whatever you tell them, they're going to use against them. That's right. So this is the reason why I ask as few questions up front as I can, Nolly. Mm. And I start, I start like this. I would start, Nolly, if you came to me and said, hey, Josh, how's the market? I'm thinking about the, all right, Nolly, look, if you're looking to come into real estate, if you're thinking about doing something here, here's what you need to know. Here's mm. what the process is going to look like. And these are the potential pitfalls. These are the things you got to watch out for. Typically, the way I try to handle these when I do them is like, this is how I make sure my people don't fall into these pits. Now, here's the other thing. You got to understand the market, what you're walking into as well, Nolly. This type of market, it's this way white right now. And here's the reason why it's this way. This is what happened to make it like this. And based upon where it is and where we've been going, coming from, this is where it looks like it's going. Because understand this, guys, and this is a dirty little secret. When you are selling real estate, you are always selling the future. 
And I say that because you, your position in real estate ends when it closes. Their life experience with that piece of real estate begins. That's right. They now own that going forward. If you can't quantify the value of what the future looks like, you've basically said, hey, look, buy this. It's a good investment. Trust me. Hey, guys, when a salesperson says, trust me, I don't know about you. I immediately, I'm from New York. I back up against the wall because God knows they're looking to slip it to you. You know what I mean? And so <laughs> if you can't explain what that is, you're in this position of, behaving like a salesperson, asking them to help get you a commission. They have to think that you're working at potentially cross purposes when your commission and their best interests do not align that you're going to pull for that commission unless you've made it clear to them, not by your words, but by your actions, mm -hmm. that your commission is secondary to the quality of work that comes out of your factory floor. See, mm -hmm. I've helped myself by answering the question, Nolly, what comes out of this factory? Mm -hmm. And that's closed customers for life, mm. right? Which means if I got to bring a partner in and give away half the commission because I don't know how to do this thing well, my customers always get the best representation. Even if I'm not it, I'll go find somebody that's an absolute killer, mm. bring them in, split the deal. I'll learn along the way how to do it better. They get a two for one and yeah, it comes out of my end. That's okay because my customers are always well taken care of. That's a standard I got for me and for my people right? That's got nothing to do with my broker. That's got nothing to do with anything other Then this is how I run my business. And that's part of in the book, what I really wanted to hit on the idea of being the CEO of your business means that you've got to come up with your business standards. You've got to figure out what you will and will not accept. Because if, if you don't, if you're waiting for somebody else to do it, don't hold your breath. That's right. Your broker's not going to do it. They, your broker is trying desperately to stay in business and do enough recruiting to stay in business because this business has squeezed them so tight. They're depending upon brokerage fees to stay in business. Mm -hmm. All right. Your team lead, your team lead, they're burning out left and right. Mm -hmm. All right. Because they, they they have basically taken on the broker's job for the broker of right. the training and all the other stuff. So they're in a tough spot. Mm -hmm. You've yeah. got to figure out what you're going to fight for in the way. And so for me, I'm going to take and say to him, Nolly, here's the process. Here's what you can expect. Here's the market. Here's the lay of the land. And it's three parts, where we are, how we got here, and where it looks like we're going. Because again, you're buying the where it's going. I want to take and say to you, hey, Nolly, based upon what I'm seeing, based upon what's going on, this is where I think the opportunities are, and here's why. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm not telling you I'm a crystal ball, but based upon the history of real estate and how it's gone. And, so, and then the last piece of this, and this is what really separates the, the winners from losers, is explaining the investment. Mm -hmm. I don't care who the buyer is. If it's a first time VA buyer, if it's a first, I don't care who they are. Whoever the customer is, I take out my financial calculator and I show them your choice to allocate capital, your choice to spend money on real estate. This is what you can anticipate that investment is going to look like in the future. Interesting. And so, I mean, I could easily show you in two seconds what that looks like. Not only would I show you what your mortgage interest tax deduction is going to be for year one, mm -hmm. which you would not have in a rental. So I'm going to help you compare and contrast the alternative because there's really three housing options, right? There's buy, rent, or mom's basement. I'm in Florida. We don't got basements. So we illegally convert our garages. Mm -hmm. Guys, there's no competition with the garage or the converter. You can't, financially, you can't compete. But if it's between buy and rent, I can take and juxtapose those two because I always want to take and make sure my customer is making the best financial choice. And if that's to rent, I'm going to be the first one to say, Nolly, you're going to be here for less than two years, bud. Almost for certain. But between the closing costs and the way in and the closing costs and the way out, you're better off renting a property. I mean, I could I could help you with it if you want me to, or I, I could point you in the right direction. How can I make it good for you? Mm -hmm. But if it's beyond that, now we get into the territory where that purchase starts to look better and better and better as time goes on because that appreciation starts to stack up. It's compounded growth. Once it's covered the closing costs and the way in and the way out, well, every other dollar appreciation is coming to my side. And if I wanted to give somebody something topical to kind of answer your question, like where the opportunity is right now, we've experienced so much appreciation right now. If I'm looking for listings, I'm totally going to my to people that have experienced a lot of appreciation and saying to them, look, guys, you've got a capital gains exclusion of a quarter of a million or a half million if you're a married couple on your primary. 
you do realize if you get any more appreciation than you've gotten on your house right now, you know, you're splitting it with your silent partner, Uncle Sam. <laughs> it, it might be time to take and sell this one and go by that house you've been trying to take and talk yourself into buying for the last so many years. I know the interest rate is higher, but here's the thing. You're locking in the price of the house now. Yeah. If the interest rates come down. You can then take and, and take advantage of the lower rates, but you're at least locking in the price and every dollar of appreciation going forward. You're experiencing 100 cents on that dollar as opposed to getting 85, 80 or 85 cents of that dollar. So, I mean, this has actually been a place that's been successful for us bringing listings in because our, our customers are American. Sure. Americans are always looking for a reason to take and and buy the thing they want to buy. I'm that's just right. piling one more little weight that they hadn't thought of on the scale to sit there and say, oh, yeah, that's right. We have a capital gains exclusion. Let's take advantage of that and restart the clock. So all future appreciation up until the next quarter or half a million dollars belongs to us tax free. You know, it's it's incredible. You know, I, I, when I started talking, I, I, I love I love hearing you speak with passion and share, you know, what you know, like you say, know your shit, you do. And and it's it's quite interesting because when I started this conversation with you and in the introduction, I talked about the fact that you are so passionate about creating consummate professionals. That's sort of what I got from, you know, reading your book and look, you know, you're, this is, this is a, and, and it starts with you. It starts with Josh, uh, you know, you really honing in on your craft, honing on your knowledge. And like you said, not following the way that a used car salesman or every other real estate agent would do it, but you're actually taking the lead. You're answering the questions that they would never ask because the client doesn't, the customer Hello. doesn't know to ask. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and when they, when they hear you talking that way and saying, well, wait a minute, it's, it's uh, you know, any doubt, any fear, any trepidation melts away in completely. Yep. completely and at that point they're almost laying their soul down and saying josh whatever you think we should you know what and this is this is and i'm sure this has happened to you many times where they say you say well guys what do you want to do based on the information because you give them the information you let yep. them decide what they want to do and they say like look josh i mean based on everything it points to this but you know we trust you whatever you say <laughs> it, it, I, yeah. Nolly, it, it's so cool because by the time you're done if you do if you do a really good talk like a, a, yeah. a state of the union on them on what's going right. on they, they they say like they're almost apologetic like uh, I, I mean they're would empowered it, would, would it be possible to work with you i mean uh, are you too busy like yeah. it's like you're gonna do them a favor exactly right? i don't have exactly. to I, I i find myself in the position i don't even have to ask for the business it's like right. not even fair yeah yeah, yeah, but yeah. I, I, there's there's two words i'm gonna give you nolly that i've really started to focus on anticipate I should anticipate what a customer not only is going to want to know, but what they should want to know. Like if they knew more, what are the questions they should ask? And I'm not going to wait for them to ask the questions. I'm going to answer them before they ask. Sure. And the second piece that is a very big part of everything that I teach is empathy. Mm. I want to remember what it was like when I didn't know yeah. and make sure the way that I explain it either gives them the freedom to ask for any part they don't understand. And one of the big things I always do is I always monitor body language mm -hmm. to take and get a feel for if they're not getting what I say. Sure. I don't even wait for them to ask. I just go explain it a different way. Like yeah. I don't want to leave them in a position where they have to out themselves as, as like, uh, uh, okay, I, I, I didn't get that. I'm going to, I'm just going to take and sit there. You know, it's kind of, not only it's kind of like this, Right. And I'll launch into something else and I'll go after three, four different ways if I've got to, because the goal is not to say it. The goal is to make sure they understand it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, it, it's interesting that the, the way you're coming across with this is I've always looked at every listing presentation that I have done uh, as a seminar. You know, yeah. uh, I go in and it's it's I'm educating the seller and then I'm allowing them to make the decision that is in their best interest based on the information and knowledge that they've been given. Totally. Um, what I, what I what I love about your approach though um and and you know that approach that I had allowed me to take over a thousand listings my first 10 years in the business. Nice. However, what I love about what you're doing that's even going a step further than what I did was you're really tapping into the future, the potentiality of what you know, because most people, their life savings is wrapped up into their property. Absolutely. Or the majority of it. And so what you're doing is you're saying, hey, let's take a look at the trajectory of this thing. Where could this thing be mm -hmm. uh, based on all the data that we have? 
Now that is really taking a step beyond. Um, and that's really sticking your neck on the line a little bit too, but, but not really when you know what you're doing. <laughs> sure. Well, right. I mean, the, the cool thing that we've always had going for us this with this Nolly is we have a fairly stable product mm -hmm. that tends to behave the same way whenever economic whenever you apply a similar economic pressure, real mm -hmm. estate tends to do the exact same thing. Yeah. And, and so I, I'll give you maybe an example of, of one. This is actually one from one of my classes that I did. I had a customer come in and he's a seasoned investor. Now, seasoned real estate investor. So automatically, this guy comes in and he thinks he knows more than me. Hmm. Poor fool. <laughs> right? <laughs> he comes in. And so if, if you watch, I actually do it on video. You could see my body language is very much controlled. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, hit me with whatever you got. I, I'm not really worried about it. I need that because here's the thing. If there's not a, if I'm not doing a lot of the talking and they're not doing a lot of the listing, it implies there's not a knowledge differential between the sure. two of us, right. which means if I don't know more than them, why the hell do they need me? Exactly. I, I'm totally exactly. answering the question why I deserve a seat at the table. So he comes in and he's telling me, I got 300 grand that I want to buy another property. You know, you have some of the cash off market because I always buy cash. I said, well, you know, cash is okay, but I mean, you know, are, are you sure you want to go that way? He's like, well, no, cash is king. And I said, well, you got to understand when you buy cash, you lose a whole lot. There's a whole lot of advantages that are just lost to you when you buy cash, Absolutely. right? And so you have to you have to weigh whether or not that, that benefit in reduced purchase price you're going to get by offering a less risky purchase to the seller is really worth it. And he says, well, what do you mean? Anyway, we, we keep going. So he, I say to him, you know, you have you have these properties. How long ago did you buy the first property? Now this is a buyer that came in that turns into a listing appointment. Mm -hmm. How? He says I bought the first one for eighty grand. I say fantastic. He says well when I first bought it I was making eight hundred was the rent. Now it's sixteen hundred. I say fantastic. So you bought it for eighty. He told I said what are you netting? He says I'm netting eight hundred a month right now. I said fantastic. So you're netting ninety six hundred a year compared to the eighty thousand you purchased it for. You're netting twelve percent. He's like exactly twelve percent. That's awesome. How do you beat twelve percent? I say is it twelve percent? You bought the house twenty five years ago. What could you sell it for today? He says I could probably net about three hundred thousand. I said fantastic. Ninety six hundred divided by three hundred thousand. You're making three point two percent of your money today. In other words. If I sell that property and take that 300K out, that's right. All I got to do is beat a 3.2% rate of return. Yep. And it's a better allocation of capital than leaving the money in this investment. That's right. Because I understand my investor. Yeah. The idea to leave the money in is the same idea as buying the property. Mm. It's when they're going to exchange their position to go back to cash in order to reallocate that capital someplace else. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so, that was, a, and what's cool is there was no prep. There was yeah. no, I didn't get a cheat sheet on what they, what he was going to say. And, yeah. and so it's very much really wrapping your head around what it is you're asking the customer to do. And, and a simple example of that is every time you ask an investor or, and, and I say an investor, that's any customer, a hundred percent of customers are investors, whether you realize it or they realize it or not, they are making the choice and tell me if I'm wrong to reduce their position in cash and extend their position in real estate. Correct. Yeah. No doubt. We're in an inflationary market right now, yeah. guys. How mm -hmm. are you liking the outlook for cash? It's getting killed on a daily oh, basis. Yeah, no you're telling us how much no they doubt. saved us now that the inflation rate's down to 3%. That means your money. That means you got to be made. The first 3% you make on your money is just standing still. That's right? right. The prices That's are right. going up 3%. Your money buys 3% less than it did last year. Congrats. Oh. What a win <laughs> that is for us, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So who here likes the outlook for real estate? L let me see if I can toss this around for you for a second. Historically, every single time there has ever been inflation, not only have real estate prices gone up, they actually go up faster than they normally do. Mm. So if interest rates go up, it's going to be as a result of there being more inflation. Mm. The Federal Reserve will raise interest rates if they sense there's more inflation. Quick review, what happens to real estate prices every time there's inflation? Oh, the price goes up. Guys, let me let me back this up. From 1970 to 1982, we went up in interest rates going from 7.5% up to 21% in 1982. That's right. The real estate prices still, with a the massive disincentive of 21% interest rates, real estate prices still went up 1% in mm. 1982. They never went down. The average... 
home price was 17 grand in 1970 in the US. Now tell me the truth, Nolly. I know you like to invest a little bit, buddy. Would you like to go mm. back with me and buy about a thousand of those at 17? Oh, yeah, no doubt days? about it. 100%. Oh my God, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, normal yes, real sir. estate appreciation in a decade when there's normal inflation and normal supply and demand. So builders are building enough and everything, like not what's happening now. You can usually bet on between 55 and 65% growth in a normal decade. That's that mm. three to three and a half percent compounded going forward. It manifests to 50 to uh, 50 to 55 to 65 percent. The decade of the 1970s, average home price 17,000. By 1980, median home price 47,002. Wow. Total aggregate appreciation for the inflationary decade 177.6 percent. Wow. So it basically tripled the normal appreciation that we'd expect in a decade. By the way, what happened to the value of the money? According to CPI, <laughs> the value of the money fell 103.45 percent, which means if you had a buck in 1970, you couldn't buy 50 cents worth of stuff. Yep. Let me recap. My real estate appreciated at 177. The money fell by 103. My real estate outperformed the devaluation by more than the normal appreciation you get in a normal bank. It was over 70% more. Wow. Right? So this leads me, I have a long history of my real estate, even with interest rate increases still. And we saw this, our interest rates went way. The prices are still going up. Sure. Yeah. So if there's more inflation, the Fed raises rates, what's going to happen to real estate prices? Just like the price of eggs, just like the price of cars, the price of yeah. real estate, the price of shelter is going to keep going up. Yeah. I mean, here's, here's the best part, Nolly. If they lower interest rates, is that an incentive? It's an incentive to buying real estate, right? It so is. what's going to happen to real estate prices? They're going to go They're up. Going, yeah. yeah. So either way, I'm huh. hedged. And what? how do I know that this is probably true too? How many investors, big in institutional investors, when this inflationary market started, bought a bunch of real estate. How oh. much capital got moved to real estate? Why? Mm -hmm. Because they know that you wind up in this position where if one thing happens, you win. If the other thing happens, you win. Absolutely. Do investors like it when no matter what happens, you win? They do. So Absolutely, save, of course. <laughs> so save a, a major black swan event, Nolly. Yeah. You know, we're in this very cool position as of today. Or, you know, it's very difficult, especially because this is the thing. In order for prices to go down, we have to get to an oversupply. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's I can't right. figure out how you get to an oversupply. I got builders building 400,000 fewer homes every year than the mm -hmm. demand. The demand is running around 2.1 2, 2, right. 2, 2. Right. million homes. They're yeah. building about 1.6 million. And they've been doing that for the last 11, 12 years. So That's we're right. more than 4 million homes short. That's right. 100%. Well, what's the inflation? Guys, you have a scarce product plus inflation, both things drive value up. I don't see where you get there. And God knows distressed assets can't help us because everybody's got so much homeowner equity at this point that if they That's have right. us, they lose their job, they're going to call up an agent and we're going to be able to get them out of the house and, and give them a check for 200 grand. Absolutely. 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 You know, it's it's interesting. You you sound like one of my favorite authors, Richard Maybury. I don't know if you've read any of his work. Mm -hmm. uh, Whatever Happened to Penny Candy? Mm -hmm. um, he, he's got, he, I mean, you, you could write those books actually, but this guy, he's an economics professor. Um, and he talks about, you know, what truly is inflation and helps you understand some of these basic concepts. I mean, he does it at a very rudimentary, which is what I love yeah. um, and the way you're explaining it. I mean, you're talking about decade by decade by decade, anybody can uh, learn that and apply it. It's, it's a model that you yeah. can overlay to where we are right now, based on what's happened in the past. It's, it's, always sort of happened this way and then you can overlay it to the next decade so yeah. based on where we are historically on the timeline uh, based on you know all the all the everything that's going on all the pointers inflation everything that you know the percentages and everything i mean when i bought my first house it was 12 percent, mm -hmm. and i was happy to pay it <laughs> yeah yeah it's down to 12 <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hard money rates now and yeah, it's down to yeah. 12 right oh, i mean what's, what's crazy is nolly it's not like this is ivory tower bs right Right. No, no. Literally, no. when this inflationary market started, guys, all my my properties were on thirty year loans with five year terms, mm. which means I had five year calls on sure. every one of my loans. Sure, I immediately got out of all of those refied at six and a half percent. Everybody told me I was nuts to walk away from my five point two rate, which, mm. by the way, would have been maturing right about last year. Yeah. 
I would have been having a refi at eight and a half and nine percent. Why? <laughs> Why? But you because saw every, the writing on the wall. You saw of course, what was going. Yeah. The government printed a bunch of money to that, take it and checks out to everybody. Is. There it is. When that's they expand in, the money supply, it devalues the in, money. That's that inflation. happens. The that's Federal inflation. Reserve has to take and raise rates to take and control the inflation. I mean, that's it's exactly just exactly right. The dominoes that's fall. And yeah. so if you're tracking, here's the cool thing. If you were tracking the 1970s to where we are today, you would have predicted every single thing that's <laughs> happened so far with yeah. the exception of one thing. Yeah. And this is a really cool one. The short-term rental fallout that happened last year where short-term rentals underperformed as much as they did. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. reason why is it's a relatively new product. Mm -hmm. We didn't have this. And this is a crazy kind of product, guys, because it's sure. a shallow inventory for us. Sure. And it's the reason why our long-term rental rates kind of softened. Right. right. Those short-term rentals kind of... Um, and that's because simply because of discretionary spending, interest sure. rates going up, and you throw in the mix that student loan repayments restarted in in, in August of I think it was August of twenty twenty two. Yeah. When that happened, the amount of money that forty three and a half million Americans that had student loans had to pay the average loan is like five oh eight a month. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 economy was based upon those student loan repayments being in hiatus for three years. So what everybody was used to yes. for the last three years was based upon this level of spending. Yeah. Now folks have these new bills. It's got to reduce what they can spend. And it did. And it manifested in the place you'd expect restaurants, movie theaters, vacation. These are the places that people stop spending when there's reduced discretionary spending. So Airbnbs had 2023 was the worst year they've ever had. Mm. What happened? People started to repurpose their short-term rentals back out as long-term rentals just yeah. to make something because they're sitting sure. there bare end. Sure. And it created an influx of supply that was unexpected. That's and right. it softened the long-term rents as well. That's right. Yeah. That is that is something you unprecedented. You never see rents go down in right. the inflationary market, but you never had short-term rentals there. That now has stabilized. Short-term rental rates have started to go back up again. And we're seeing the rental market get shrunk back down again we're starting to see rents go back up so well it's know. interesting because you already knew when uh the when they started printing money okay when there's an increase in the money supply and they started issuing all these incentives that a lot of people were excited about uh we, you already knew what the next three to five years was going to be you know totally with, with that you already knew you know Have so 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 it's quite incredible quite incredible man so so i know we're we're we actually have gone over time i want to get you back to your family but um, what should, I mean, obviously, uh, I want agents to get your book, uh, talk a little bit about it, close for life. Um, it's out on McGraw Hill, one of the yep. top three publishers and the number one educational publisher in America. Um, and so talk a little bit about the book. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the, the, the both books were a labor of love. The, the, the most, the most recent one, uh, close for life was, was really, Putting all the, the the three pieces, I I didn't even really touch on it, but the idea of yeah. I've kind of alluded to it being the CEO of your business. It's Absolutely. one of the things that agents get wrong, forgetting mm -hmm. that you're the boss. They get their customer wrong. They mm -hmm. go approaching their customer like the customer needs a friend. They don't need a friend, guys. That's not what they called. They they weren't lonely. That's not what they call a real estate agent. So getting your head wrapped around, they had a real estate problem that made them pick up the phone and agree to separate themselves from the kind of money that we see a commission check is mm -hmm. that's, that's to right. take and deal with that fear. They're willing to pay that much to make the fear go away. Mm -hmm. And the last piece is agents don't understand their product. If I mm -hmm. want to embarrass a real estate agent, the easiest way I know is Nolly. I look them right in the eyes and I say, so, so what's good about real estate? Mm -hmm. Oh, I get to make my own hours. No, no, no. That's your job. What's good about the product you're asking people to buy. And they usually will do one of two things. <laughs> Or they give me a porky pig. Mm. -ba 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 -ba. They can't answer. Yeah. And so you're asking somebody to buy something <laughs> and you don't really have your head wrapped around why what you're selling them is a good thing. Uh, it, it's putting you a major handicap on the way in the door. Sure. Sure. And so that's really what Close for Life was designed because all that stuff, all three of those things are not things that are addressed in mainstream real estate education. And so it's fixing well, the problem. You know, you, you the fact that you said that, I, I didn't even mean to cut you off, but I got excited about this idea. You've got an incredible coaching program, which is among the best that I've seen. I, I, I mean, if you're listening to Josh Cadillac right now, you're still with us here on the podcast. You already know this is a man who knows 
his stuff. Okay. And so you, you should, you should want to learn from him. You know, he, he's someone that I look up to as well. So talk a little, I don't know how, how much you can get into the coaching side of what you do, Sure, um, but you've got an incredible coach coaching products and, and things like that, that I want people to know about. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll make it as brief as I can. I mean, I I've done one-on-one -on -one coaching for people and it always hurt my feelings a little bit to do it, Nolly, only because the folks that are typically coming to me, their business is hurting. And now, I mean, I have to charge them for my time. And, and, and it's a lot. I mean, because, I mean, if I was to show you my calendar, it, it, there's a lot of calls on my time. I've seen like, it. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I feel bad. I got a person that's hurting and now I got to take and charge in this big check. So I, I, I wanted to take and come up with something that was like economically feasible for most people but still gave them access to the idea of close for life, the ability to reach out. And if they desperately need help, you know, here's an answer, here's an idea, here's help. So uh, the the current uh, thing that I've done is I, I've started a mastermind program where I have a lot of recorded versions of my classes. Some of the material, most recent things that I've written are there, recordings of previous mastermind sessions and all the other stuff is all there. And we meet once a month for a mastermind session. And then I have pop-up sessions every single week that we do on Zoom that I'm in where we'll either interview somebody that's a freaking rock star, that's one of my vendors, like one of my people. Like, you know, you say, hey, Josh, I need somebody entitled Nolly. I got a guy. You talk to my guy. He'll take care. Like, these are the people that have gone to bat. Like, getting these guys that are the no BS people that actually get it done and do it well. So talking to those folks, I, this, this coming week, I have my capital market guy, the guy that I buy distressed mortgages from and you know, these are guys that I spent years trying to get access to, mm -hmm. and and now I have them there, and and at a number, at a price point that agents can can easily handle. Like if your business can't handle twenty bucks a month, yeah. I think we have to be having a very different conversation with each <laughs> other. And so I've made it just ridiculously cheap, yeah. because I really want to just help as many people as I can, and give them something that is just the value to what I'm charging you is so ridiculous that we, we have nothing to complain about. Right. And Absolutely. so I'm not looking to undercut anybody. I'm not looking to challenge anybody at 20 bucks a month. They can go to 10 other people's coaching products as well. This is just one more thing that is everything I can give you all in one spot. And, you know, we'll make it up in, in more people that we help. Uh, you know, I've never heard anything like it. So, so what, what's the domain for that? I mean, how do they get that? How if they, they go to the close for life website, Okay. Um, there's a place there to, to sign up for the mastermind. We'll put a and link. We'll put a link in the description. And beautiful. Close and there's a life. discount code. Uh, the discount code is less thirty. And less it takes thirty. It, yeah, it takes it from the the retail price of like fifty bucks a month to nineteen ninety nine. And incredible, uh, incredible, yeah. man, so incredible. Um, two more things. I'm gonna and, and I know we're over, man. Your your dinner sure. getting cold. But you said something earlier that I thought was fascinating. And that is, um, you know, I'm a big funnel guy. I've been a big funnel hacker since 2017. I like, I started with click funnels. Now I'm in go high level and I'm building all these funnels and I love sales and I love marketing. But you said something, you said, I'm not about building funnels. I'm about building hourglasses. Sure. And so I did a visual of that in my head and I've got an hourglass sitting up there, uh, right, right up, right up here. You can see it there. There's my hourglass. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I like that. I like that because- uh, so talk to us a little bit. Of, I mean, I, I I can visually clearly see what you're talking about and what you mean. Yeah. By, you know, it, it starts off as a funnel, but then guess what it becomes? Boom. So so talk about that for just a second. So, I mean, at the top is like everything that I'm putting out there into the universe to try to bring business in. All right. I, and, you know, for me, typically, and I don't know what your your position in this, Nolly, but for agents, I tell them usually never to focus on more than three things. That's you know, right. find three money-making activities. If it's going to be cold calling, how many commit, That's do it. it, hold yourself That's accountable. It. If it's going to be networking, how many networking events are you going to sign up to a week, whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. These are the things that you're going to do. You're, these are my money. Make, if, I, if I find myself doing nothing, like, oh, right. okay, what's the next thing I need to do? These are the things that I need to do, right? right. And, and it takes, it moderates itself because you start to get busier and busier and busier, and then you have less and less time you can give to those things. And it's just keeping those things balanced that keeps the top of the funnel full. Sure. But what is the bottom of the funnel? Mm. The bottom of the funnel are the people that you actually close. These are the mm -hmm. commission checks sure. that roll in. That's right. Now, most agents take and practice Tinder real estate. And what I mean by Tinder real estate is Tinder is all about the hookup, right? What do you do? You connect. 
You do what you got to do to get what you want. And then you never call them the next day. Mm. That's not what I do. <laughs> These are the folks, guys, the reason why you got gas in your car and mm. why the lights are on in your office is because these people trusted you with their business. Mm. They trusted you with something that is bigger than probably anything else they were ever do. I had this policy of calling and saying, you ready for this? A very complicated idea. Thank you. Mm. I had the policy of calling these folks back up and saying, you know what, guys? I was just thinking about you. How you been? How's it going? How you liking the house? How mm. you like not owning the house? <laughs> like, mm. How are things going in your new location? How is ever? How are you? Mm. That's it. A hundred percent of my business comes from that because those folks. I'll give you a little. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you. I, I love you, Nolly. I'm gonna give you a little one straight out of one of my <laughs> okay. low ball offers. All right. Let me show you what the difference is between an agent that closes deals and an agent that closes customer for right. life. That's a right. low ball offer comes in. Now, guys, I have addressed before. Before a lowball offer ever comes in at the listing presentation, I have discussed with my seller, look, offers are going to come in. They could be all over the place. As long as you got me, you always got the hammer. You can always sit there and say, no, go jump off a bridge. And you don't even have to say it. I'll tell them to go jump off the bridge, right? You could tell them it's so low. I'm not even going to talk to you. Or if an offer comes in and it particularly hurts your feelings, you can let me do one of my favorite things, Mr. Seller. Mm. You can let me counter them higher than the original asking price. All right. Mm. So house is listed for 450. Offer comes in at 287. You've been a listing agent, Nolly, so I know you've gotten these. What does the header say <laughs> in the email? All cash oh, offer. Yeah. yeah in the yeah, body yeah. of the email. Please let us know the seller's response. We're super excited to get a deal done at this price. I'm like a 287. I'm excited to get this deal done as a buyer for me. There's no, everybody wants it at 280. What do you mean you're excited? You're out of your mind. If you're excited, show me in the price, right? So I'll call my seller up because I've addressed this in advance. And I say to my seller, I'm sending you an offer over. I'm telling you right now, it's low. Let me know if you want me to do the thing. And I hang up the phone. The phone <laughs> rings immediately. The seller says, Oh, Josh, do the thing. So I will take and send, let's say you're the agent that sent it to me, Nolly. I'm going to say, hi, Nolly. Thank you so much for your offer for, of 287000 on our listing at 487 Cherry Tree Lane, currently listed for $450,000. At this time, my seller is counting you at $1,586,789. No, no, here's the good part. Please present this to your buyer and let us know their response. We are very excited to get an offer done at this price. <laughs> and I BCC my seller yeah. on the email. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Man. You want to know who loves admission. it more than anybody? So the good. seller loves it. So the seller good. feels like, because let me explain to you, that seller feels like when they sent that offer, it was getting the middle finger. Sure. Their and agent it. just double birdied the other side. That's it. <laughs> Anybody comes from my people, they got to come through me. They're going to hurt right. their feelings. Right. I'm going to get them. Not, they're not going to get away with it, right? That's and right. And it's not unethical. There's nothing. It's funny. Yeah. But my yeah. sellers are sitting there telling their friends, oh, man, you should have seen what my agent did. And you know what they love even better? When you send me an email back, there must be a mistake. Where did you get that number from? Yeah. I sent you an email back that says, my number came from the same place your number did. And I put <laughs> my customer on that email. Yeah. And they could just see the other agent like the smoke coming out of their head. Yeah. Like, oh, man. It's That's little great. stuff. It's you little know, stuff. No. It's funny. It's funny, Josh, because you live in the same city my aunt lives in. She's been living there for decades. Uh, but your New York is coming out, bro. Your New oh. York is coming out. I love it. I love it. Okay. Last question I have for you, and then sure. we're going to let you go eat dinner, is – um. What, what would you say to an agent right now? You know, maybe they're a little, uh, they feel like, man, this is overwhelming. I've heard mm -hmm. Josh. I get what he's saying. I need to be that agent. I want to be that agent. I should, you know, because listening to you, Josh, it could be, e it, it's easy. It could be possible that an agent can say, man, I don't have game like that. Yeah. I want to be that. I want to be, I want to be that guy. Sure. Sure. Um, no, I, I, I mean, understand this is a collection of years of pain and suffering picked up in the doing of this. So expecting tomorrow to get it. But I, what I can do is I spent a lot of time running around the maze mm -hmm. trying to figure out where the exit was. So let me lay out 
what I think are the three low hanging fruits that you can hit on that will make you better at mm. this industry where you're, will give you the most ROI for your time. The first one is you have to understand valuation. All right. And I'm saying that one because it's the least sexy of the three. All right. Mm -hmm. That you got to be able to know what something is worth and be able to make a case that is incredibly compelling to both the appraiser and when the appraiser comes in with the wrong number to the bank. Because I'll tell you what, Nolly, the other day I got an apology letter from the bank because mm -hmm. their appraiser was off. And the way I took and explained the valuation, they knew they were wrong and they paid for a second appraisal. Wow. I watermarked my career. I loved it. Wow. So understanding valuation. The second one, guys, you must understand negotiation. And it cannot be the touchy-feely stuff that they teach you in real estate. Oh, just hold hands and sing songs and it'll be okay. Guys, it cannot always be a collaborative negotiation. And sometimes the best route to a collaborative negotiation is the figurative right hook. I don't mean you punch people. I mean, sometimes that other side's going to come at you hard. And the only way to get to a collaborative negotiation is to hit them back so hard that they have to respect what you got on your side. Mm. And all of a sudden, well, no, no, Josh, I didn't mean it like that. I mean, obviously, we all want to get a deal. Oh, fantastic. We can play nice. And sometimes, folks, depending upon what part of the world they're from, the only way for them to be happy in a deal is to feel like you're absolutely miserable. Mm. Like they crushed your soul. So yeah. guess what you got to learn how to do? You got to learn how to, act. oh my God, you're, man, you're beating us up as you're laughing all the way to the bank because you would have taken 20,000 less. It's part of what you got to know, right? right? And so that negotiation piece. And then the third yeah. piece you got to know, and guys, this is where you can make so much leverage is you must understand the investment of mm -hmm. real estate. Because if you can talk about that, you are in that rarefied air that other agents just don't even know that they should know. Mm -hmm. And so the kind of the kind and quality of conversation that you have pre-negotiates a way that you're lazy, not very smart, overpaid, and all about commission. You don't fit into the peg of what real estate agents in the customer's experience sound like. So they're forced now not to treat you like what their default perception of an agent is, but they're now forced to treat you like a real estate expert, like a real estate market professional. And that is a box that they don't really have clearly defined in their head, mm. which means that you'll actually be judged based upon your behavior and not a preconceived notion that is not conducive to future business with that customer, not conducive to forming a lifelong bond that this is the oh, real estate. No, no. If you got real, I got a guy, you got to go talk to Nolly. If you want to do real estate, you talk to Nolly. I'm going to get Nolly on the phone right now and you tell him what you want to do. You tell him I told you to call. He's going to take care of you. He's the only guy you talk to. If your customers are not saying that about you mm. as the CEO of your business, that should be what's keeping you up at night, answering the question, what am I doing wrong that's not getting that result? And so those three categories mm. are the ones that I wish, because guys, I chase 50 things to find those three. And then there's more stuff beyond that. I mean, I would always sure. say, you know, Either the book that you recommended, Nolly, or Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Easiest economic books to read. Understand economics a little bit. Read a book. There's a, one of the best books ever, The Bitcoin Standard. It is one of the best books about money I have ever read. If you want to understand money, the history, what makes it good. Because understand, you're asking them to exchange money for real estate. Yeah. If I know what's wrong with money... I have the other half. If I know what's good about real estate and I know what's wrong without money, I can have a much more robust conversation with people. So those would be two things, you know, that foundational stuff that's not real estate specific. Sure. I don't teach you in school. I'm a builder, Nolly. You know, like if I want to build a tall skyscraper and before I go up, I got to go down. That's right. And so I want to dig a, build a deep that's foundation. Right. So, and so important. You got to build that foundation so deep that that thing will be there for, you know, for, absolutely for, forever. You know, when they when they hit until you, they tear it you're down. so strong, you're good. Yeah, absolutely. Josh, we appreciate your time, buddy. Man, you you are a true gem. This is a breath of fresh air. Uh the just the information that you shared, um, valuation, negotiation, investment, understanding those core principles. And nobody in real estate school ever told me that I had to know any of that stuff. So I love it, man. And and th this this is the stuff that will make you a consummate professional. Uh guys, if you you absolutely owe it to yourself and your family to be part of Josh's coaching program. I mean, it's the, the lowest price I've ever seen for, for one. And uh, I appreciate you, brother. Um, how can we get a hold of you? What's the best way for people to reach out? 
Um, as I said, close for life is good. Josh D. Okay. Cadillac, Instagram. My email is is easy enough, and I respond to 100% of my emails, josh at joshcadillac.com. So any of those things are wasted. Love that name, bro. <laughs> the only one I got, man. People think I changed it. I, uh, believe it or not, there's a whole story to that involved the FBI and my grandfather in World War II and whatever else. But yeah, um, uh, the Italian guy, they made him come in and change his name. But that's a, that's a different story for that me. That is wild. That's wild. Josh Cadillac, guys, you heard it here. And this is one of the best podcasts I've ever had the privilege of being part of. And uh, thank you again, brother. Over and out. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Success with Listings podcast. If you are serious about taking your real estate career to the highest heights, making more money and helping more clients while working less hours and spending more time with your family, be sure to get your copy of my free book, Triple My Listing, absolutely free at successwithlistings.com. Now you want to be sure that you subscribe to the podcast and check out successwithlistings.com to get your copy of my free book. Hey, I'll see you on the next one.